Thank you so much for joining us. This is Eric L. Dunham at the Mindset Disruption Strategist. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Redefining Success. And today, today is going to be powerful. Just get ready. That's all I've got to say. My guest today is Daryl Stinson. Daryl is an entrepreneur. He's a pastor. He's a speaker. We're talking a little bit about it. He's a suicide survivor. He also spent time as an athlete. And all of every single one of those experiences have shaped him in an incredible way. And he's got such a heart. Daryl and I met about a year ago at a conference we were both attending. We had some time to just spend some one-on-one -on -one time together. And I'm glad for you to get this one-on-one -on -one time right now because that was a blessing to me. And I wanted this to be a blessing for my entire audience. So Daryl, thank you so much for joining us today. Man, it's my pleasure. It's been a long time coming. I'm so excited to dive in with you. Yeah, no, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. Daryl, you and I know each other a little bit over the weekend we spent together, but we're, you know, you know how this works. We're sitting in a backyard barbecue. These are all my friends, all my listeners who are, who are joining us today. Why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about who you are. Yeah, if we're at a barbecue. Can you please pass the chicken? <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will. I just pray I didn't burn it. That's my only <laughs> Yeah, man. Um, so yeah, I'm Daryl. And uh, I grew up in a town uh, called Jackson, Michigan. It's about an hour and a half west of Detroit. I uh, grew up in the, the inner city, uh, the streets, as they like to call it. I um, was an all-A student until I got teased for being a Black kid who, quote unquote, talks and acts white. Mm -hmm. And uh, when that happened, it created some identity issues in me. It's when I believed the lie that who I was authentically wasn't enough to be liked or loved by other people. And for me, it was being teased. For a lot of people that I know, uh, it was not being included uh, at the lunch table. It was uh, getting rejected by a girlfriend. It was something that caused them to think that who they were authentically wasn't enough to be liked or loved by other people. Mm -hmm. And so what I did was I started to change everything about myself to fit in with the black community. I changed the way that I talked. I changed the music I listened to. I even changed the way that I laughed. Uh, I started skipping school, selling drugs. And by the time I got into the seventh grade, I was a completely different person. Um, I was a drug dealer. I skipped school. I was trying to have sex outside of marriage with girls, all in this effort to really gain the reputation and the respect of the black community. And it worked for me. They embraced me. I got street cred. They nicknamed me goon and called me kingpin for running mm. the streets. And uh, I just had this big inflated ego. Uh, but here's the thing. Deep down, I knew it wasn't me who they were accepting. It was who I was pretending to be. Mm. Okay. And it began this trend in my life of learning how to be externally successful while inwardly failing. Wow. Okay. Wow. Hard pause. Yeah. Uh, external success is not the same thing as internal success. Uh, it's possible to have one without the other. Yeah. And that was my life. And I started to just get better and better at sports. I earned a full ride scholarship to play football at Central Michigan University. Um, I was ranked uh, 79th in the nation for football. Mm. And I was top 100 for basketball. And um, I had all this promise that I was supposed to go to a high level play in the NFL or the NBA. And at the end of my freshman year, I got hurt. Mm. Okay. Um, I had to have an emergency back surgery or else my left leg was going to go paralyzed. And so uh, the coaches told me they would honor my scholarship. They said, uh, you got a golden ticket, son. They said, you get to focus on your education. You get four free years and you can come around football whenever you want because we value your leadership. But they didn't understand that for me, sports is what I, it wasn't just what I did, it was who I was. Mm. Okay? Let me say that again. Sports wasn't just what I did, it was who I was. Mm -hmm. And whenever your identity is attached to your activity, you make poor decisions. Yeah. Usually you'll make the decisions that has the activity's best interest in mind versus your best interest in mind. And so for me, I knew it was better for the sport. If I came back and played, I knew that me hurt was better than the next guy fully healthy. And I knew that I could contribute to the team more um, being a player than I could being a coach. And so I begged the coaches to let me come back and play the game of football. And I signed a liability waiver and I put my body through two years of absolute torment. 
Uh, yeah. The way that I describe it is that I wasn't supposed to walk for more than a mile within six months of my back surgery, but I ended up earning a starting position as a defensive end in a division one football program wow. that was ranked 23rd in the nation that year with Antonio Brown and number one draft pick, Eric Fisher, all because of something called opioids, pain, pain mm. pills. Yeah. And so I had developed this addiction to pain pills and um, I was still playing, starting, making some impact, but you could tell that I was never the same after the surgery because I never fully healed from the injury. And uh, I was taking so many pain pills that they were thinning my blood to the point where every time I made contact on the field, my nose would bleed. And the coaches saw that something was really going on with me. And they said, low, going into my senior year, they were like, Daryl, we don't know what you're doing, but we're going to get in a lot of trouble if we let you continue this way. And so they kicked me off the team. Okay. And that's what I learned that uh, I had a lot of inward failure that mm. the emotions that I was running from, that I didn't know who I was outside of sports, that the insecurities that I had, that I didn't think anyone liked me other than my ability to be an athlete, right? Mm -hmm. I knew they loved me for my gift, but I didn't think they loved me for me. And that's not an issue that was specific to me. I, I know a lot of uh, CEOs, yeah. a lot of entertainers, a lot of high achievers who feel the same way. People like me for the money that I can earn. People That's like right. me for the way that I lead. People like me for the, 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 how, how, how gifted I am when I sing and open my mouth. They like my gift, but they really don't like me. And so because I had all those insecurities and I never talked about them, because I believe that real men don't show weakness and that if you show weakness, then somehow that makes you a wimp or a girl, uh, that if real athletes don't cry. So if I cry, then that's uh, showing a weakness. And so I was taught all that. So all I did was suppress the emotions. Okay. Yeah. I didn't express them. I suppressed them. Mm. And the problem with suppressing emotions is that you may not feel it in the moment, but they still sit there. Yeah. And they build up and they build up to you either explode or implode. Mm. And so for good. me, I imploded. Um, I started to hate myself. I hated that I didn't know who I was because I had changed my identity from a kid. Yeah. Um, I hated that uh, I didn't have any idea what I wanted to do with my life because I put all my eggs in one basket through sports. Mm -hmm. And so that put me in a dark phase of really feeling like I didn't want to be on the planet anymore. Mm. And at that time, I was dating a girl for four and a half years. We did all the cute stuff that people should do. You know, like uh, we wrote my last name next to her first name in cursive. We picked out our kid's name. We used to stay up on the phone all night long just to hear each other breathe in the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> and we were supposed to get married. But when I was no longer going to the NFL, she left me and got engaged to another man. And the way that I found that out is from a friend of hers, not from her. Oh, no. So that validated that insecurity that, see, me without sports is not, no one really likes the real me. Mm. So um, uh, I started toying around, uh, taking more pills. And ultimately, I made my final attempt in a car, um, which is a whole God story in that. And thank God, I ended up in a psychiatric care facility in Detroit, Michigan, where that's where I found my faith in Christ. Mm. And my life completely transformed. I mean, it was like night and day. Really? Um, not yeah. only did I find my faith in Christ, but I read my first personal development book. It was Joyce Meyer's Battlefield of the Mind. Yeah. I saw my first counselor. I did my first journal entry and I saw my first psychiatrist. And I started to learn the value of building your life from the inside out versus mm. the outside in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And from there, success rapidly happened for me. I graduated, got my degree in integrated public relations within a year, uh, which was a statement because I had to take 23 credits while working a job, while doing a paid internship. Wow. wow. I got hired in to work for the university uh, in the communications department. Within one year, I was running um, a major communications initiative that involved both our local campus and our global campus. I won two awards for higher education marketing. Mm. I left that and started my own marketing consulting company, then became a pastor, then uh, launched a nonprofit called Second Chance Athletes to help athletes transition out of sports, wrote yeah. a best-selling book, had a family, three daughters, <laughs> whole accomplishment in itself. Yeah. And 
I become the man that I am today to produce a TEDx talk that has 1.4 million views and counting and help other speakers turn their messages into movements. And so that's my life and my story. And uh, it sounded a little keynote-ish, but that's, that's, I wanted to summarize it quickly so we can get into the meat of how people can take lessons from my losses and apply it to their life. Yeah, no, but I love that. I love that. I actually even, you said something in the very beginning, I think that a lot of us don't realize that you so keenly are aware of what happened, probably not at the moment, but how many times do we take someone else's definition of success, right? So you're growing mm -hmm. up in the, in the neighborhood and you're like, you're not black enough. Yep. And so their definition of success is you need to change your image. Yep. That's not your definition of success at that point. That's their definition of success. How many times do we take somebody else's definition of success and then change the entire trajectory of what we think we're supposed to be doing because somebody else said that's what we're supposed to do? All the time. Yeah. All the time. And it's crazy because I remember when I left uh, Central Michigan University, um, there was people who were, I mean, I was still an entry level employee. I was making like 40 grand and, um, I was doing a lot, <laughs> should have been making like 150, but right. it, that, in higher ed, that's not how it works. You know, you got to put <laughs> in your years, got to get tenure there. Right. And, um, I remember, uh, talking to several employees when I made the announcement that I was leaving and with tears in their eyes, looking at me half their age saying to me that they wish they could do what I was doing, which was leave and do something that they love with their life. Mm. And I'm sitting there like, man, you're way more equipped. I'm young. I got to like prove myself. You've got all types of portfolios and resumes and experience right. and age. Nobody's questioning you. And like, this is, you should have left a long time ago, you know? <laughs> and, but it is that perception that no, this is, this is success. Like I made it here. I got this salary. I have these benefits. I have this esteem. People respect this job title. And I don't know if they'll respect the thing I mm -hmm. want to do entrepreneurial wise or et cetera, et cetera. And so living out someone else's definition is like uh, living out someone else's definition of success is like golden handcuffs. Oh, that's good. You're chained, but you're chained by gold. Yeah. And so yeah. what do you do? And that's what it's like for a lot of people. And, and the fallacy in that is that here's my belief. I don't know if you share this belief. I believe you do. Yeah. I believe that the, the way you become the most profitable in life is by doing that thing in which you were created to do. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I wholeheartedly believe that. Well, I mean, it comes back to, I'm going to play on this, keep playing on this, but I mean, sometimes the definition of success is, you're only successful if you do it while you're young. I just, again, I'm listening to the story that you're just telling. And sometimes we paint ourselves into a corner with the story that, well, I've missed my window. I've missed my mark to go do that thing I was created to do. And that's, that's another misguided, you know, success definition that's out there. Well, you didn't do it then, so you can't do it now. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I just did a post today and, I, and it was about a uh, story that we get to define the meaning that we tell ourselves about our story. Yeah. Right. There's, there's people who will say that. And there's people who would say, man, now is the best time. I'm more educated. I'm more smart. I have more relationships. I have a larger network. Now's the best time for me to launch. And by the way, ask Colonel Sanders if it was too late for him. That's there's right. No, oh, Colonel, and then of course, favorite he's, story. Well, he's an anomaly. He's not an anomaly. I know people who are still going back to school. I speak at colleges and I see people that are 60, 70, still going back to school, okay. still pursuing the education. I just talked to one of the guys that was the founder of NSA. He's 80 something plus years old Love and he's it. still doing new things and stretching himself. It's a mentality. And so here's the thing about it. Is he that thinks he can and he that thinks he can't both are correct. That's right. That's right. Well, I want to pull something out because you just said this guy's 80, right? And you talked about Colonel Sanders. But I mean, the, the, the one thing that I think that we've got sold a, again, a misdefinition of success is that, well, you're looking forward to retirement at 65 when we're living till 90 or 100 years old and how much wisdom, I mean, how much wisdom you've garnered. Maybe that's the point you're supposed to just be getting started rather than sailing off into the sunset. Yeah. So I have a whole belief around that. Um, here's my belief, right? Yep. Is people often think like it, you're winding down when you get older. I actually think you're winding up. 
Mm, and I'm yes. not just talking about in terms of activity. I'm talking about your mindset is the most powerful tool. Yeah. Uh, think about this. You're the most closest to your purest form of self. Uh, and I have proof of this. Okay. Um, number yep. one, there's a TEDx talk. I love TEDx talks, obviously. <laughs> but there's tell. a TEDx talk by Jill Bolte. I okay. encourage everyone to watch it. Um, I, I'm blanking on the name right now, but her name is Jill Bolte, B-O-L-T-E. Okay. Phenomenal when she talks about how she lost certain parts of her brain, how she was able to uh, be highly successful and, and, and be more successful because her mind, her limitations, her old story was not getting in the way. Wow. I have a mentor who is a former Fortune 100 executive. He left that and started his own HR firm, super highly successful. He and I uh, co-organized a TEDx event together here in Metro Atlanta. Yep. That's how he became a mentor to me. And he was already a level of wise and smart when we first met, but then he had three strokes and a heart attack mm. and he lost certain functions of his brain. But what's happened is all of that caveman brain, all of those old beliefs, all of those old stories that he used to tell himself, all of those inclinations to be frustrated and offended and hurt, all of the, you know, tendencies that he had to overwork and say he was too busy and all that stuff went away. And now you're getting the purity of his spirit because he's closer to death. Yeah. This guy, I'm telling you, when every word he says, I'm just like <laughs> leaning towards the screen, like, whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Wow. In fact, um, there was this time, uh, and you can find this on YouTube. Uh, I was uh, in one of our mentoring sessions that was supposed to be an hour and it turned into four. <laughs> <laughs> he starts to talk and it was so profound. I just hit record. I, I didn't, some told me to hit record. Yeah. And I got about, I don't know, two to five minutes of it. And uh, it was so beautiful of what he was saying about how to live in awe and wonder of life. Mm. Yeah. And I recorded and I played it at our TEDx event and I put it up on YouTube as well. And so, uh, man, I just think that we have to be careful of the story that we tell ourselves because we'll always be right. That's right. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. There, I mean, you've done so many things and we could talk about so many different things. I want to kind of t take this question. What are you most passionate about today? I mean, what's the thing you're doing right now that's getting you out of bed and like you're just you're living your best life through? Uh, helping leaders turn their messages into movements. Um, I hit a, I, I, not a ceiling. Uh, it, it was more so I, I, I had a revelation okay. and this may seem simple to most people listening, but it was not simple for me because it was profound because it wasn't something I had thought of before. I was trying to change the world and impact the globe by telling my story, which I was doing 1.4 million views speaking on the road every week. But I realized that I could only help those who could connect and relate to my story. Mm. Right. I, I didn't realize that the skill set that I had, that the experience that I had to create a movement for myself could impact far more people if I taught other leaders who are not at all connected to my story to do the same thing that I've been able to do through TEDx. Okay. And when it, God showed that to me, yeah, it was almost like, it felt like salvation all over again. <laughs> it was like, what have I been doing? I've been so focused on me and my message, not in a selfish way, like impacting other people, being vulnerable with my mental health story, not realizing that I could help other people with other movements Yeah, that could help people that I would never be able to reach or talk to. And so I started nice. to do that. And, and one of my recent clients, um, her name's Sonia. Uh, she's from Indian descent. I mean, we were completely different. Our upbringing was different, you know, like whole different culture, whole different belief system, whole different uh, just personality type. She's all like healthy and, like, <laughs> and, and, and she went to, she was an executive at IBM and blah, 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 blah. Right. Um, but she dealt with a lot of things growing up from her culture mm. um, that she was helping other people through. She became a client. Uh, we got her on the TEDx stage. Oh man, she's crushing it. Um, her, it took me two years to hit 1 million views. Yeah. She did it in three months. What? Wow. Wow. That's amazing. And it's not the views, man. You know, the views is just a number. 
right? It is, it is the people who are watching and reaching out to her. Okay. Saying, oh my gosh, thank you so much. I was delaying happiness till one day, someday when I have this, that, or the other. I didn't realize it was found with it. Mm. Wow. Thank you so much. I felt the same way from my Indian parents. I felt like I had to marry the people that they wanted me to marry because of X, Y, Z. I didn't know that I had the freedom to choose. I yeah. didn't know that I can create a life of my own. Like that's the stories that are happening through her, through yeah. her. And they would have never listened to me, <laughs> but yet indirectly they are. Yeah. My influence in her. And so that, that is what I'm most passionate about is helping those leaders. So, I mean, if you're helping these leaders kind of unlock, are there two or three things that you find like almost every person struggles with um, that like if they could unlock would really then begin to make a difference? And, and I'm going to imagine it comes back to it at its core is they think that success is something that it's not. I'm going to guess. But what, what yeah. maybe it just it doesn't have to be two or three or maybe even one or two things that are just really yeah. keeping leaders stuck. The first thing that comes to mind is that people dramatically underestimate the power of their own story. Mm. You know, I, I did it. And, and people don't believe me because I do have like that whole suicide powerful story moment. But I used to feel that way. I used to feel like my story doesn't matter. Like I used to listen to Eric Thomas all the time who, you know, ate out of trash cans and live in abandoned buildings. I listened to Les Brown, who was labeled mentally educated, retarded. And yeah. I, I would listen to TD Jakes all the time, talk about preaching with holes in his shoes. And I'm like, man, I didn't, I'm not, my story's not that powerful. I ain't been right. doing that much. And I underestimated the power of my own story. And it's the same as true for most people on this planet is we think that our story isn't that special or we think it's beneficial, but we don't understand the power that can happen if we actually invest it in our story. Mm. And that's the number one thing. So a lot of it is, is um, getting people to open up to let me into their life story so we can find the most powerful thread within that story. Yeah. That's the most challenging work. I can't tell you every single speaker I work with. It's like, I, I have the, this little form. I'm like, do you have an idea what you want to share on the stage? They all got stuff, you know, they all look successful. They got all types of keynotes ideas and it's all good stuff. And every single time we get on that first hour session where we ideate and we go in deep and at the end of it is something that they never even thought of mm. because it was buried beneath the pain of rejection. It was buried beneath their definition of success. It was buried beneath you name it. And everyone needs that because it is impossible, if not hard, like to read the label when you're inside the bottle. Mm, so good. And that's why we need other people. So that would be the number one thing I would say that I find is that common, uh, you know, block or limiting belief or thing that people have to overcome, yeah. you know, to your definition of success thing. I think that's one of them. But I found that like a lack of openness to who can pour in my life, to who mm. I can learn from. Yep. I was going to say the, 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 the phrase coachability, but I feel like people would be like, oh, I'm coachable. And I'm <laughs> like, uh, by who? Right. That's so good. Yep. Right. And you can learn anything from anybody. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll give you a tip here, um, a storytelling tip. They say never make a point without telling a story. Never tell a story without making a point. I learned that from Les Brown. And um, I'll tell you a story about this. Um, I got assigned as a, I think I was like 23, 24, to pastor a church where everyone in my church was 65 or older. Wow. And their age was not a problem at all. It was their mindset. Mm. I mean, we moved this wooden pulpit and you would have think we crucified Jesus. Wow. Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> they tried to stop church. And we only had 17 people. Wow. And the building was so out of order that the nursery had mice in it. Oh. Because they weren't even expecting visitors. Right. And they had been married longer than I've been alive. Yeah. And the, the problem is that God doesn't work through titles. He works through people. Yes. Yes. <laughs> see i'm gonna preach a little bit come on and if you get so caught up in title and you get so caught up in status you miss the gift that he's trying to give to you through people yeah if moses would have got caught up in extra spiritual he would have never got wisdom from jeff bro yeah that's so good 
That's true. And, and, and I'm not just talking about me because I could have did the same thing to them. I could have been like, man, these old folk, they're religious. They can't tell me nothing. But you know what I learned? Because I was had to build relationships with them. I would sit down for them, sit down with them. And I would ask them questions about their life. And the thing about old people is, is a lot of times, you know, they don't have nowhere to be. Yep, right, <laughs> right. So they got all day and, and, and I don't, you know, right. but I'm listening. I'm being patient. And here's what happened every single time I learned something from them. Mm. Okay. Mm. And guess what else happened? They learned something from me. Yeah. yeah. We started to build trust. And I think that people have a hard time listening to others who they don't think fit their definition of success. Mm. I can only listen to you if you make more money than me. If I'm black, I can only listen to you if you're black. If I'm white, I can only listen to you if you're white. If I'm a male, I can only listen to you if you're a male. If I'm a female, I can only listen to you if I'm a female. Yeah. And it is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. And it is the thing that keeps people the most stuck because they're missing wisdom that God is trying to send through their life, send to their life through people who they never expected. So I think mean, about I, that. Right. I mean, it's at the end of the day, we learn more from the people I think who have a different opinion or a different view than us than we do anyone who has the same opinion as we do. <laughs> that's why Jesus had Judas. That's right. Oh, that's good. And what we try to do is get rid of Judas. And Judas is like, come on, Judas. Yeah. Manage the money. Mm. I'll do more with you than without you. Wow. I needed to hear that today. I needed that today. Mm. And, that, and, and see, that's why you are who you are. And that's why you have the success that you have is because you're so open. You're so open, man. You, the moment you encounter revelation or truth, you might wrestle with it a little bit, but you turn and pivot quick. Yeah. And if more people could do that and stop sticking and clinging to their own ways and their method and their plan, oh my God. Gosh, our world would transform overnight. Wouldn't it? People would just humble themselves and do something that they're afraid to do and listen to someone who they never thought they could listen to and learn something mm. that they never thought they could learn and do something that they never thought they could do. Yeah. Yeah. I was talking to somebody earlier today and we were having a conversation. Um, I think it's, I'm trying to remember somewhere in Romans, but it talks about God working through us. And so many times what we don't recognize, what I just heard you say that I'm even looking at myself is that I've got to be careful, right? We're like a pipe. Mm -hmm. And if we choose to just get stuck, then God can't get anything through us. If we won't let that pipe flow, then we're just like a backed up sewage system. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's it. But he can use other people to get his ideas and his thoughts and his perspectives through us. And even if we don't agree with someone we learn from their perspective and why they think what they think. Absolutely. That's absolutely. So. And we have to be careful on uh, putting periods where God puts commas. Mm, yes. And we have to be careful of uh, assuming that our truth is the truth. Okay. I'll give you an example about a recent thing that just happened. Um, you know, uh, just at the time of this recording, uh, the Will Smith slap just happened in, uh, uh -huh. at the, at the awards ceremony. And there's a lot of people who are uh, claiming their truth as the truth. Yeah. When really their truth is just a, a, a perspective that they hold. It is a reflection of themselves. They're making conclusions about Will Smith's motive and why he did what he did. And it's only because that is how they see themselves. Mm. So the growth opportunity in that is rather than uh, judge his actions is actually to reflect on self. And yeah. what did that moment bring up for you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so for me, when I saw that, it brought up for me, my upbringing, the pressure that I had to perform for the women that were in my life. Mm. Mm. Now I can say that's why he did it, but I don't know. Yeah. But that's what I see as a reflection of myself. And so that is where I can grow. I don't grow by criticizing Will Smith. I grow by seeing what happened through Will Smith and see how that reflects on my own story and the meaning that I gave to it.
Oh, I love that. I, I'm thinking back about three weeks ago, I was in the room with R.C. Sproul's son, and you may or may not know who R.C. Sproul is. R.C. Sproul is a, anyway, his son was talking to us and he made the comment, he goes, the danger that we often have when we watch somebody else's story, and he was using the Bible specifically, or we read about someone in the Bible and we see the sinner, or we see the person who made a mistake, or we see the person who did something wrong is that we don't realize that that's us. Mm-hmm. Ooh, that's powerful. Yes. Right. So you can look at Will Smith and go, well, Will Smith yeah. should have done this or this or this and realize maybe the better question is, what is it within me that would have triggered me to do the same thing? And what do yes. I need to work on? Oh, that's so good. Yes. Yes. <laughs> right? Yes. Yeah. You know, I, this isn't every single, that's why I love what you just said. Every single lesson, that lesson's not about Will Smith. That lesson's about Eric. Yes. Yes. Because Eric just as easily could be in that position. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Mm, that's so good. Mm. Um, Daryl, we're going to run out of time if I'm not careful. So I'm going to just, I mean, what do you, if someone just came up to you today and said, what is success? How would you define success today? Obedience, mm. expression, faithfulness. Mm. Obedience to the call of God and the will of God. Mm -hmm. Expression, meaning that every gift I have, every personality trait I came here with, I express it. And um, faithfulness, mm -hmm. staying power, resiliency, mm -hmm. toughness, fighting the good fight. Standing in my truth, even when it's not popular. Yes. Sticking to my belief, even when it's not favorable. Mm. Saying no to clients, even if they're ready to pay me, but they're not a good fit. Ooh, there's a good one. Faithfulness. That's good. That's good. Because that last one comes down to knowing your value. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's one thing I see. There's so many nuggets in here. That's a, that's a one place a lot of people get success wrong. Success is what was my pro what, how many new clients did I sign up last month? Well, if you be signed up 10 new clients and every single one of those are not good for the value of who you are, you didn't succeed. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's powerful. That's powerful. Very powerful. It's three generations from now, what do you want your great grandchildren to remember about you? That I loved better than anyone they knew. Mm. Um, I and when I say better than anyone they knew, it's just like I want to set the example. Yeah. Uh, that I was a living testimony of what it means to walk by faith. Ooh, I love that. Yes. Dare we've talked about a lot of different things. Is there anything that you wanted to make sure you got to share today that I didn't give you the space to share? No, I feel, I feel like we got into a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> it's been good. I, I did. Uh, and I'm going to listen to this one two or three times myself. <laughs> Me too, man. I'm, I'm excited. Um, but I'm thankful for everyone who's tuning in. Yeah. Um, I just hope I did a, a great job at not just sharing my story, but at giving people things that they could uh, reflect on themselves and improve their lives and uh, calling some people into the depths of their story yeah. uh, to know that um, we can comment all day. We can post all day. We can hide behind our company's success, but our story is still the most powerful thing in the world. Mm -hmm. And if I were to use scripture, uh, I would tell you that we overcome by the blood of the lamb yes. in the word of our testimony. And when you think about that comparison, that being in the same sentence, oh my gosh, it, I just got chills. Mm. Because you talk about the power of the blood of the lamb mm. being in the same sentence as our testimony. Mm. That's how powerful your story is, Eric. That's how powerful our listener's story is. Yeah. Wow, I haven't been through a lot. I haven't done all of this stuff. Your story is your story. Yeah. And if you would just submit to that scripture, yeah, align your belief with that scripture, I wonder what doors would open for you. Amen. 
Oh, that's, that's good. it. Daryl, this has been so good. If someone's listening and it's like, man, I want to know more. I want to get in touch with Daryl or I want to follow what he's doing. What's the best way for people to do that? Go to my website, DarylStinson.com. Uh, you can follow me on any social media. It's either my, my first and last name or at Stinson. My last name speaks. Ah, very good. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for making the time and thank you for bringing the word. It's my pleasure, man. Well, I love what you're doing, Eric. Appreciate you. Yeah, I appreciate you too. Thanks so much, Daryl. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. We will see you again next week. God bless you.